Dear friends and followers, welcome back to my channel and in today's video we'll be diving into the fascinating world of jet engines, specifically focusing on the turbojet engine as part of a small video series about that topic. I'll take you through how they work, the physics behind them and some cool engineering details that you might not learn at a typical flight school. So if you're curious about what keeps an airplane flying, this is the perfect video for you. So what are we waiting for? And let's get started. So in this video, I will focus on the most basic form of a common jet engine, the turbojet engine. Now, nowadays, turbojet engines are mostly found in military aircraft only, and that for many reasons. One major reason is fuel efficiency. But for more details on the evolution of civil jet engines, I encourage you to watch my video about that exact topic, which you can find right up here or here. Let's quickly dive into the history of the turbojet engine. The first airplane ever to be flown and powered by a jet engine was the Heinkel HE-178 with its HES-3 engine. The first jet engine to be mass-produced, however, was the Junkers Umo 004. When comparing the looks of these two engines, they are clearly different in design. The Heinkel engine is a so-called radial jet engine, while the Junkers is an axial jet engine. Both have different characteristics when it comes to the buildup of pressure and mass flow. More about this later in this video. For now, it's important to know that the axial jet engine is the one that is commonly used for the means of propulsion nowadays. Sorry for the quick interruption. Just wanted to say, if you want to become a pilot and you want to inform yourself on all the steps that you need to beg, or if you need a supportive community, if you are already on your way on becoming a pilot, check out the link below and join my Patreon group. You will not regret it. It's a huge group of people who are just willing to help. We're gonna have regular Zoom calls. We're gonna have direct messaging. We can chat with each other. It's gonna be great. Check it out and see you on the other side. See ya. Composition and parts. To understand how the turbojet works, we need to take a look at its design. We'll use the General Electric J79 jet engine as an example. This engine is famously known to have powered the F-104 Lockheed Starfighter. A conventional turbojet in its most basic layout can also be referred to as a gas turbine or combustion turbine. It consists of three major components the axial compressor in the front, a combustion chamber, and a turbine. The compressor and the turbine are connected to each other by a single shaft and are surrounded by the engine casing. In order to describe the basic principle of how this engine works, I am sure you have heard me using the term suck, squeeze, bang, and blow before. Basically, air is, gets sucked into the engine where it is compressed, mixed with fuel, ignited, and then pushed through the turbine and the nozzle. The turbine draws energy from the hot airstream, which is then transferred via a shaft to drive the compressor. Since this is a continuous process for as long as fuel is delivered to the combustion chamber, we can also refer to this as a cycle. Now, I'm sure you have clicked on that video because suck, squeeze, bang, blow is not enough as an explanation for you. Therefore, let's take a look at how and why this principle works. So the next part is super in-depth on thermodynamics of a jet engine. If you want to skip that part of that video, you can jump forward to this timestamp and from there on the video will again be a little bit easier to digest. All right, let's have at it. Don't worry, I do not expect you to have a degree in mechanical engineering, so I will mainly stick to idealistic and sometimes simplified explanations. The principle behind jet engines is based on the so-called Brayton process or cycle. Now, the Brayton cycle is a thermodynamic method to describe the inner processes of an engine. Now, in our case, we can showcase this by looking at what engineers call the TS diagram. 
The vertical axis of this diagram displays the temperature and can also be seen as a measure of the system's inner energy. The horizontal axis is therefore the entropy. For those of you who haven't heard of entropy before, entropy is a thermodynamic concept that describes the degree of disorder in a system and the irreversibility of processes associated with it. Therefore, in the ideal Brayton cycle, the compression as well as the expansion of air is seen as idle, meaning there are no pressure losses due to, for example, friction and no heat is exchanged between the system and its surroundings. Those processes are called eccentropic compression and eccentropic expansion. In this ideal case, the entropy does only change when heat is introduced into the system as it happens in the combustion chamber. So as the amount of heat increases at that point, the pressure remains constant. Now this process is called isobaric combustion. The ideal cycle is then closed by dissipating the heat into the surrounding atmosphere. Now before we talk more about the different phases of this cycle, let's ask ourselves what is an aspect we need to focus on with this diagram? Well, let me tell you, it's the most important thing about a jet engine, thrust. The thrust force can be determined by the mass flow, meaning the mass of air that we've put through the engine in a certain amount of time, times the velocity of the flow at the nozzle exit, minus the velocity of the approaching air flow. And here's the equation for that. Now, given that equation, what do you think in which phase of flight does a jet engine produce the most thrust and why? Let me know in the comments below. Now, what we can take away from that equation is that in order to maintain thrust, the exit velocity must always be higher than the intake velocity. Now, looking back at the Brayton cycle, we can see two long curved lines. Now those lines are isobars and represent the lines of constant pressure within this diagram. What is super important to know about those isobars is that they have the natural characteristic that they diverge from each other, which you can easily spot because at the distance between both at the beginning and at the ending, they are different. So very simplified, and generally speaking, our goal is to take advantage of the isobaric divergence. Therefore, we need to first increase the pressure in order to raise our pressure level to a higher isobar. I hope that makes sense. Now, in flight, the first increase happens automatically since air is getting pushed into the engine inlet with the relative inlet velocity being equal to our cruising speed. Now after this, the air is then compressed by the axle compressor, which leads to a further increase in the inner energy equal to the specific work of the compressor that puts it in. Now remember, in our ideal case, this is an eccentropic process during which not only the pressure increases by a lot, but also the temperature of the airflow. You can compare this to your sort of muscle pump power pump when you fill up your bicycle tires, although the compressor in a jet engine causes a much higher increase in temperature with temperatures rising up to 500 degrees and more. Now following this, the already hot and pressurized air enters the combustion chamber, gets mixed with fuel and is then burned at temperatures spiking up to 2000 degrees Celsius. The pressure, however, is seen to remain constant during this process. So by increasing the heat within the system, our inner energy increases again, which increases the entropy and takes us upwards on the isobar within the diagram. At this point, the highest temperature and the highest amount of inner energy within the system is reached. The air will now enter the turbine in which it is expanding while the inner energy is drawn out of the system again and therefore decreases. Now this amount of energy is the turbine work, 
which in the ideal cycle equals the absolute value of the compressor work, since they need to be sort of balanced out for the system to work. The remaining pressure decreases as the air is pushed out of the engine through its nozzle. The remaining inner energy is converted into the kinetic portion of the exhaust stream, which leaves the nozzle with a specific exhaust velocity. So comparing the amount of kinetic energy at the beginning of the cycle versus that from the exhaust stream, a clear increase can be noticed. And that is the thrust we're talking about. And that is the advantage taken from the isobaric divergence, which enables the engine to produce thrust. You may want to rewatch this part again if certain things are unclear. If you've repeated a couple of times, it does make more sense. I've placed a timestamp for you, making it easier for you to find the beginning of this chapter. Otherwise, let's move on. Now that we know the basic physics behind the Brayton cycle, let's take a closer look at how the three key components of the engine work in detail, starting with the compressor. The axial compressor can be divided into different stages. A stage is formed by the set of rotor blades and stator blades. The rotor blades are mounted onto the shaft and given their name, rotate at different speeds depending on the power setting. Stator blades are mounted in the casing and remain stationary. In most cases, compressor blades can easily be distinguished from turbine blades. They are much thinner and lighter given the fact that the structural and thermal stresses acting upon them are far much smaller than those acting upon in the turbine. As we can tell from the Brayton cycle, we need to increase the energy and the pressure of the airflow. So in the compressor, this is mainly achieved by forcing the air through the converging path. And as you can see, the path the air needs to go through becomes narrower and narrower throughout the compressor. To understand the concepts behind compressors and turbines, it is important to know that only the rotating components are doing the work and either put energy into the airflow or extract it, as for example, the turbine blades would do. In case of the compressor stage, the first set of blades are rotor blades. They are responsible for increasing the flow's energy, namely pressure and temperature. They are also introducing an angular momentum or a twist to the flow, which then needs to be taken out of the flow again because ideally the rotor blades need a twist-free flow to work. This is where the stator blades come into play. Because of their orientation and their profile, the twisted flow is deflected and approaches the next stage twisted free. Every stage is responsible for a specific increase in pressure leading to the flow reaching its maximum pressure before entering the combustion chamber. The ratio between the air pressure in front of the compressor and the one at the end right here just before entering the combustion chamber is one of two major design parameters and is called the OPR, the overall pressure ratio. As an example, this engine right here has an OPR of 3.42 to 1. It is limited by the structural integrity of the compressor. One big challenge when developing compressors is the increasing pressure gradient throughout the compressor. Since the ambient air pressure in front of the compressor is far below the pressure at the end, the air constantly tries to flow upstream in order to equalize the overall pressure in the system. Now the compressor needs to work against that discontinuously and flawlessly in order to overcome this gradient and increase the pressure. This is the reason why there are more compressor stages than there are turbine stages. The flow in the turbine is meant to flow through the turbine towards a low pressure area. The flow in the compressor is not. Its pressure is meant to be increasing, which works best by increasing it stage-wise and overcoming multiple smaller gradients one stage at a time. 
This, by the way, is an advantage of the radial jet engine, which is able to overcome bigger gradients with less stages. However, one reason why axial jet engines are used nowadays is that the possible mass flow of it is by far greater than that of a radial engine. Fun fact, if for some reason the flow through the compressor is disturbed, a reverse flow can be the result, which then would lead to a compressor stall. Short interruption, would you want us to record a video on radial jet engines? Please comment below. Combustion chamber. Coming out of the compressor, the air will enter the combustion chamber where jet fuel is introduced through the fuel nozzles. Right here. Modern engines have so-called air fuel spray nozzles installed, which optimize the atomization of the mixture and therefore the burning behavior of the flame. Igniter plugs are also used to ignite the mixture during startup or situations where continuous ignition is required to prevent a flame out. Under ideal conditions, fuel is continuously burned with no further need of the igniter plugs until the engine is shut off. Still, the plugs can be activated manually or automatically if the combustion is disturbed or the engine needs to be restarted. The purpose of the combustion chamber is to increase the energy of the flow by converting the chemical energy of the fuel into thermal energy. When we think of the Brighton cycle again, it is the key component that allows for an increase in inner energy while moving up on the isobar at the same time. At the end of the combustion chamber, the temperature reaches its maximum. This temperature is the second of the two major design parameters and is so-called TET, the turbine entry temperature. It is strictly limited by the materials used for the turbine blades. The problem is that those temperatures can easily be a couple of hundred degrees above the actual melting point of the blade. Only through special cooling techniques it is possible to operate at those high temperature without the turbine blades melting. Turbine work. Speaking of turbine blades, let's take a look at them. Other than the stages in a compressor, the stages of an axial turbine have a flipped rotor stator arrangement. So the first set of blades in a turbine stage are stator blades and then the second set are rotor blades. That's because the airflow leaves the combustion chamber almost twist three, so the rotary set of blades, which are doing the work, need to be approached by a twist-induced airflow in order to draw the energy from the flow. Other than in the compressor, the stator blades of a turbine introduce a twist to the flow and the rotor blades draw the energy out, which is then transferred to the compressor via the shaft. Throughout the divergent shape of the turbine, the air then expands whilst its pressure and temperature decrease again. Okay, this engine also features an afterburner, which we'll be focusing in video three of this series, so we're going to skip this part for now. So after the turbine, the flow enters the exhaust nozzle of which the primary function is to regulate the pressure ratio within the engine to maintain the pressure needed for the engine to operate properly. However, another function of the nozzle is to enable the exhaust stream to exit the engine at high speed by flowing through the convergent nozzle section, which ultimately leads to the production of thrust especially in the turbojet engines. That was all the basics you need to know about the turbojet engines. Upcoming videos will focus on the big brother of the turbojet, the turbofan engine, and also a special addition to the jet engine, the afterburner. So stay tuned, you do not want to miss that out. And that's it for today. If you have any more questions or explanatory notes regarding the physics behind the turbojet engine, feel free to use the comment section below. If you have some other aviation related question, please be sure to check out my other videos or ask in the comments below for the chance to have your question answered in a future video. Thank you very much for your time and here is your checklist for today. Subscribe to my channel, check activate the notification bell, check 
follow my Instagram account, check. And don't forget, a good pilot is always learning, especially when he's at the Deutsches Museum here in Munich, wishing you all the best. You're Captain Joe.